Hebrews chapter 2, and I want you to look in verse number 5 and follow along as I read out loud. Hebrews 2 verse 5 says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. We're going to stop our reading right there. And let's pray once again. And I know we've prayed several times already in the service, but we cannot go to God too often asking for his help and, and uh, for him to meet with us. So let's, let's do that now. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use this time in your word this morning to speak to our hearts. And God, we've come for that very purpose this morning because we need something from you, God. We need the words of life uh, uh, rightly divided and applied in our own life. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage hearts this morning and uh, accomplish your purpose for while we're meeting here today. And Lord, more than anything, we want you to get honor and glory out of everything that we say and do here. And so, uh, Lord, we just ask for your presence to be very real in this service. And Lord, that you would accomplish things of eternal value in our midst this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give a little bit of context before we jump into the verses that we've read this morning. But in the Hebrews chapter 1, the author of Hebrews is writing to obviously Hebrew people. And the whole purpose of his writing is to explain to them that Jesus is superior to anything that they would have understood prior to Jesus in the Hebrew economy or system of thinking. Jesus is better than the law. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than Old Testament sacrifices. Jesus is better to everything that the Hebrew people were aware of, and that he is superior. And he starts off by saying, in regards to even the prophets, uh, that, that God who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us. And then he, uh, he says that he's spoken unto us by his Son, saying that Jesus Christ is a revelation from God that is comprehensive, that nothing is left out that man needs to know other than Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul said in the book of Colossians, and ye are complete in him. Jesus is literally everything we knew, uh, we, we need and everything we need to know. Uh, but he goes on over the next chapters to take subject by subject that the Hebrew people found very special and were very dear to them and of great importance. And while on, in most cases the author of Hebrews never degrades or, or says that those things aren't important, he just makes sure to point out that Jesus is better. Uh, in the first chapter, he's talking about angels. And, when he's, and, and you need to understand that the Hebrew people, they thought angels were incredibly important. Traditionally, Hebrew people believed that it was angels that actually hand-delivered the law of God to Moses from God on Mount Sinai and, and that they're the ones that communicated the law. And so God spoke the law to Moses, they believed, through angels. And they believed that it was angels who brought so many messages in the Old Testament period. And we can't really doubt that because the Bible includes several Old Testament stories of where messages were hand-delivered to prophets uh, by angels, especially Daniel and, and I think of a few others. And so that's not, that's not altogether untrue. You might remember uh, uh, jo Joshua going out before the battle of Jericho. And, and there was an angelic being. I believe it was Jesus Christ himself 
uh, pre-incarnate who visited uh, Joshua that night and gave him the battle plan to go up against Jericho. And, and God's people saw that work. So they, they really revered angels as God's a means of communicating to man. And they had so much importance on that. But now the author of Hebrews comes along and says, Listen, I know you have a lot of respect for angels. And angels are real. And they are ministering spirits that are sent from God uh, to help us. But they're nothing compared to Jesus Christ. The revelation that they've assisted in bringing to man is never as complete as the revelation of God that we see in the person of Jesus Christ. And so in chapter 1 and even in, in chapter 2, the author is making his case that, that Jesus is more superior than angels. And that's why we started where we did in verse number 5 because one of his points that he's making is that angels are never going to be in charge or in control of this world or the world to come. And as he makes that point, he, sa he says, he's, he's calling to, uh, them to think about the scriptures that they know. And he says, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. And so when he talks about putting the world in subjection, this is an interesting concept that I want to spend a little bit of time this morning talking about. Because really the question that we're asking here is who's the authority when it comes to this earthly life? Who's in charge? Who's in control? And if we were to go all the way back to the beginning in Genesis uh, chapter 1, we find in verse number 26 that uh, God says to himself, and as a person who regularly talks to himself, I'm thankful God does that too. And so God says to himself, let us make man in our own image, uh, and so he said, he said, what we're going to do is we're going to create man. And then he said something very interesting. Let us give him dominion. And when God says that, what he's talking about is, he's saying that we're going to give man some authority. Now this authority that God's going to give man over the rest of creation is an interesting concept because this dominion or this authority not only involves uh, having a say, uh, but also having a free will, the ability to make some choices. And God even illustrated that very early dominion of man when the Bible says in chapter 2 of Genesis that God made all of the animals to pass before Adam and whatsoever Adam called the name of those animals, that was their name. That's what they were called. Now there's some people that believe that the, the sovereignty of God is this concept where Man has no choice and God does not ever fit himself into the choices of man, but rather God is always kind of like a, uh, like a, a voice on our shoulder actually making every choice for us and, and, and man's not making any choices. But this, this argument doesn't hold up to Genesis chapter 2 because God said himself that Adam got to choose what the names of those animals were and whatever Adam called them, guess what? That's what God called them to. So this wasn't God sovereignly doing something through Adam. God sovereignly gave Adam a, an ability to choose. And then God honored Adam's choices. So later on when you're reading the Bible, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but when God himself speaks about a horse, God got that name from Adam. And God calls that animal what Adam called it way back in the garden. Because part of that dominion was the, was the authority in matters of God's creation that God placed Adam over. And therefore, when uh, part of God's plan was to create mankind. And we know this from the text. We're going to look at it again in just a minute. But God created man in his order of created beings a little lower than the angels. Somebody says, well, that means we're not supreme. Well, you should have already known that. Of course we're not supreme beings. As a matter of fact, we're not even the supreme created beings. There are created beings that are way more powerful than we have. There are created beings that have way more authority than we have. And, and for one, I'm glad because those beings, 
uh, especially those angelic beings that God created that have more authority and more power than me, God says that they are sent to be servants to us. That's interesting to me. And so he says, yet even though they have more authority and they're more powerful in that man was created a little lower than them, God never gave them dominion over the earth. God never put all things in subjection to them. But in God's original plan, God gave man dominion over the works of his hands. God gave man dominion over his creation. And God meant for man to lord over his creation, conserve his creation, to, to, to dress the garden and keep it. And the Bible's talking about that. Look, we can't, we can't act like uh, uh, taking care of our planet is a liberal concept. It's actually a biblical concept. God, God put us in this earth to keep the earth and we should be concerned about in the environment. And we, could, we should be concerned about being good stewards of the resources that God has provided for us. Somebody says, oh man, you've brought a, a liberal from the flyover states to preach in this, in this West Coast church here. But I'm just being honest with, with us this morning. Uh, we can't dismiss every concept because some of it is biblical, some of it's true. We have resources on this planet and it is all we have. And we need to care for it. And we need to be responsible with it. And so much, so many times, man is so selfish that we're not responsible with our resources. And, and, and I do believe that, there, that, that, that waters can be overfished and, and game and livestock can be overharvested and things like that. And, and I'm all for the, the care and the value of the resources God's given us. Now, I do think there are, there are things that are declared to be scientific today that have no basis in science whatsoever, and they're no more than scare tactics to get government control. I just believe that. There, I said it out loud. I don't know, I don't know who's watching this, but, but, but that's my personal belief. I, I don't think that everything is actually based in science, or if it is, it's science falsely so-called. But that doesn't mean that we just get to uh, devour the resources God's given us on this planet without any thought of another generation or something like this. Why? Because God created man to have dominion, to have authority, and to have, watch this, some control. That was God's plan. That's what he put into place. And yet, by the time the author writes to the Hebrew people in chapter 2, he says in verse number 6, he acknowledges this. By quoting Old Testament scripture, he acknowledges this. Boy, man sure has changed. There's no way that anybody can say that man is what God originally created him to be. Would everybody agree with that this morning? Man's not what God originally formed from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he, he became a living soul. No, as a matter of fact, God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to walk with them and to fellowship with them and so that they could bring glory by, uh, by choosing to have a relationship with this almighty God. Something that the animals don't have opportunity to do. Animals are loved creations of God, but animals are creation for man's benefit. They're not his crowning creation. And I said this at camp last week, so young people have already heard this, but I might as well tell everybody, we're not animals. We're not part of the animal world. God made us above the animals. God made us to have dominion over over the animal world. But what happened was when challenged to believe something other than what God said, man made the choice to believe a lie of the devil and reject the truth of God. And when man made that choice, death entered into the picture and sin has been passed unto all men. And that's why we're not what God originally created us to be. 
And because of that, there's consequences. Sin always has consequences. And the number one consequence of sin is separation from God. You see, we got our authority, we got our opportunity to have control over the works of His hands and the things in this world from God. But when sin brought death into the picture, with de- which death means separation, when, when, when sin brought death into the world and into humanity and man was separated from God, now all of a sudden when God came to visit man, man was hiding because of the shame of the consequences of his sin. So, so now there's a separation with God and God comes in the garden and man's not there to fellowship with him. Man is separated from him. But God sure did love man. And so God made some promises to man completely by his grace. Not by any merit, not because of man's worthiness. Because man lost all worthiness the moment he disobeyed God and sinned in the Garden of Eden. But unworthy as we are and mercifully as God is, God made some promises. One of those promises was that he would make a way for man to be reconciled back to him once again. And life would be tough. He promised Adam that. He looked at Eve and he said, Eve, your husband's going to rule over you. Your desire is going to be to your husband moving on. And childbirth is going to hurt. That's what he said. And then he said to Adam, he said, Adam, because you've sinned, you're going to have problems making a living. You're going to have difficulties putting food on the table now because you were part of this garden that I created for you where all you had to do is just dress it and keep it. Dress it and keep it basically means that you've got to just, you've got to cut things back because they're growing so much. But now because of sin, Adam, the earth is cursed for man's sake. And now whereas your only job was to keep things from growing too much, now you're going to have to work by the sweat of your face. Anybody ever heard the phrase, the sweat of your brow? Well, that's nothing compared to the sweat of your face. You ever been there? Growing up in Kentucky, uh, I uh, worked on a horse farm from the time I was about 11 years old. And uh, we would uh, re our fields about every five or six years to have the most premium alfalfa hay that we could to sell to horse farms and things like that in Kentucky and, and Tennessee. And so there would be days where uh, we would get thistle that would be growing up in our alfalfa. Well, let me tell you something. When somebody's paying, a, and this was a long time ago, when somebody was paying $6 for one square bale of alfalfa, if they found a bit of thistle in it, you were going to get a phone call. And you were going to be hauling a new load of, of, of uh, alfalfa hay over to them. Because the farmers that we were doing business with, they weren't just like farmers that were throwing it off the back of a truck. They were farmers over in Lexington, Kentucky. I don't know if you've ever been to Lexington, but we're talking miles and miles of the most pristine fences you could ever see. The reason they're paying for premium grade alfalfa is because there's, they don't have to worry about there being anything in there other than alfalfa. And so if we had thistle coming up in a field, that means we're out there by hand cutting it out, keeping any seeds that might have formed from falling on the ground so it's not growing new stuff. And, and I mean on some hot days, we're out there and we would have on leather gloves. Let me tell you something about a, a fully grown thistle plant. It doesn't care about your leather gloves. Man, those, those thorns and thistles on those things will go right through cowhide uh, leather gloves right into your hand. And I'm going to tell you, it was hard work. And, and yeah, there were days I wished my brow is all that was sweating. But it was more like the sweat of your whole face uh, just pouring off of you. And God says, Adam, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take something to make a living. In order to do it right, you're going to have to put in some work. 
more work than you did before the fall, it's going to be tougher on you now because it, it really has a lot to do with this. Because whereas a lot of your environment was controlled, now you're going to have to deal with adverse circumstances that, are, that you can't control. And God allowed, because of sin, God allowed problems to come up that were not part of his original design and not part of his plan. And the writer of Hebrews says that when you see where man has come to as a result of sin, you have to ask the question, we've so much departed from God's original creation, why is God even mindful of us? Why does God even care? What is man that God would visit us? But he did. He's never given up on humanity. He, he has never turned his back on humanity. He says in verse number 7, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. This was in the original creation. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. Now somebody might be reading this going, wow, that's biblical truth. He, he, he made us a little lower than the angels. That's a pretty special place to be. I'm okay with that position. Because while it's not the top, it's a long way from the bottom. I'm not exactly sure what the bottom of his creation would be. Maybe the mosquito. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I don't, I don't want to say, um, I would say the cat, but that would be offensive to some people. Uh, I'm more of a dog person myself, but but we're we're not anywhere close to the bottom. As a matter of fact, a little lower than the angels. That's pretty good. I don't know if you're with me or not. That's pretty good. A little lower than the angels, and he's crowned us with glory and honor. And then I like this. He put all things in subjection under us. And some of you are like, I didn't know that. I have not been exercising enough authority. But I have scripture now. I have Bible. I can go out here and say, look, I live in this world and God put me here and put all things into subjection under me. So I've not been using the control that God actually gave me. So I need to be more in control of my circumstances. And I'm going to tell you, you can walk out of this building this morning and you can try to control whatever you want to, but you're going to find this out. That ship has sailed. That, that original aspect of creation is gone because here's what reality is going to teach you if you don't already know. You're not in control of anything. I'm saying anything in this world, we're not in control. I, I know that we've tamed and domesticated some animals but even tamed and domesticated animals still do their own thing when they want to I told you I, I grew up on a horse farm I know this for a fact I, I've been on that horse that the owner said oh they're so gentle yeah until I got on their back and then they decide differently and you say well you just got to you know, God puts you in creation over them, so you just got to exercise authority and you tell them what's up. Well, here's the deal with a horse. They have more musculature than I do. And I've been on horses that didn't care about that bit in their mouth. They were going where they wanted to go. And I found out that this authority that I'm supposed to have is gone and the thing is, if I, if I stop reading right there where I stopped just a moment ago, if I stop reading in verse number seven, uh, I'm sorry, verse number eight, when he says, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, and I go out here and I try to live like that, I'm going to fall flat on my face or get hurt or find out from reality that that's not the way it is. Because if you keep reading, then you'll read this statement where he says, but now we see not yet all things put under him. Now that's the reality. The reality is 
Because of sin, man's not in control of anything. We forfeited our dominion. Yes, we still get to, we still have choices that we get to make. And that's part of it that God didn't take away from us. But, but at the same time, when it comes to authority and control over the situations of this life in this world, we don't have that. Foundation Baptist Church, you know that probably more than a lot of churches do. You didn't, you didn't have control when they shut down the lodge to say, uh, actually, we're still going to go ahead and meet in there. And if you'd have tried that, you would have found out you don't have that authority. So you had, to, you had to make some moves and you had to meet under a pavilion for a while. But under that pavilion, you didn't have control over the weather. And it got cold under there. And so while you're making decisions, and that's part of, of what God created us to do, while you're making decisions, you have, you're having to respond to things that are out of your control. I, I want to make sure we're all on the same page here because this is important for us to understand. We live in a world that is not under our authority. Where the, the creative works of God's hand and how they interact with each other. I, I'm talking about the weather. I'm talking about sickness. Um, I don't know if you've thought about viruses in the last year and a half or so, but... It's pretty amazing that here this thing that can't even be seen with the human eye is shutting down the world. And I don't care how mad you get or bitter to say, I don't want my favorite restaurant to shut down or I, I don't want to go online at church or I don't want to do this. Reality says you're not in control. Been in Washington for 12 days. And one of the most talked about conversations that I've had with many Washingtonians. Was, was, uh, is that right? All right? I'm not going to try to say it again. We're just going to leave it right there. But Washington residents <laughs> is this. You know, we have people that run for political office. And we want to see them be our leader. But it's almost like our voice doesn't carry any weight. It's almost like our vote doesn't matter. And you know what the reality is? Even when it comes to government, <laughs> we don't have control, even though our Constitution says we the people of the United States. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? We can, we can live with the illusion of control but that's all it is it's an illusion and somebody's like man I'm glad I came to church this morning because that is the most depressing thing I've ever heard <laughs> in my entire life I did, I'm glad I came this morning for a man from Missouri to get up and tell me I have control over nothing in my life I didn't say you don't get to make choices I'm just saying ultimately we don't have the dominion that God originally gave for us to happen, which means you don't have control over whether you get sick or not. And in many respects, you don't have control as to whether you get better or not. And you don't have control. You can, you can train up your child in the way that they should go and trust that that training is never going to leave them but some people like to take that verse and say, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it as some kind of promise of God that they'll never go astray or they'll never be wayward or something like that. But when it means they shall not depart from it, it means it doesn't mean that they're not going to make bad choices or they can't make bad choices. It just means that if you do train them up in the way they should go in order to make bad choices, they're going to have to step over what you've trained them and what you've taught them from God's word to make bad choices. But there's people sitting in this, this church building this morning who would have to say, I taught them the word of God, but they still walked away. And you found out that you had a choice whether or not you were going to love them and admonish them and, and nurture them in the ways of the Lord. But 
you didn't have control over the direction that they went. And I, I'm aware of the hurt that can come from watching a loved one walk away. And I'm aware of the, the difficulty in relationship. And I know how uncomfortable it can be when, when we get sick or someone that we love gets sick and we feel so helpless. But I'm telling you, all of reality is screaming this truth. Watch this. But we see not yet all things put under him. Reality is a constant reminder that we're not in control. And if that's where we left it, we would have to walk out of here this morning with no hope. Because there's nothing under our control. Our situations are hopeless because there's nothing we could do about it even if we wanted to. But I'm thankful that is not where the author stopped. Because look again with me at the end of verse number 8 when he says, But now we see not yet all things put under him, verse 9, but we see Jesus. Look, reality teaches us that we're not in control. Well, where's the hope in that? There's no hope in that. But here's where the hope is. We don't see all things under man's control, but we see Jesus. We open up God's Word looking for His revelation. And lo and behold, what do we find? We find His Son, how He's communicated to us in these last days who is the brightness of the Father's glory, who is the express image of His person, who upholds all things by the word of His power. We don't have to be in control. We don't have to see all things under man's control. You know why? Because we see Jesus and He's enough. That's who we really need to see. I don't have to be in control of everything in my life to see Jesus. And when I see Him, here's what I see. I see a God who knows what's going on in my life. And not only do I see a God who knows what's going on in my life, I see a man who understands what I'm going through. And these two concepts are exactly what the author of Hebrews goes on to explain in the rest of the chapter that this is that Jesus Christ is a God who is omniscient and he knows all things but he also became a man like you and I that he might taste death for every man that he might suffer that he might be tempted that he might experience human life so that he wouldn't just be a God who knows but he's also a man who understands he's touched with the feeling of our infirmities so the fact that he understands what we're going through uh, uh, contributes to the fact that he's a God who knows what we're going through. And then he goes on to say this, he's a Savior who cares about what we're going through. I'm just kind of outlining the rest of the chapter for sake of time. But he's saying he's a God who knows, he's a man who understands, and he's a savior, or the, the, the terminology he would use is a high priest, uh, an intercessor, a go-between. I'm just going to call him a savior. He's a savior who cares about what we're going through. i got to be honest with you. When I look at Jesus, I don't have to feel like I need control. When I look at Jesus, when I see him for who he really is, I'm okay with not having dominion. Because he does. And he, he's not a sinner like I am. He can't mess it up. Nothing can ever take his dominion. And he is a faithful high priest to me, meaning, meaning all of these things. He's a God who knows. He's a man who understands. He's a Savior who cares. And when I see Him for who He really is, it's okay with me that I don't have control. As a matter of fact, it's a little bit more than okay. Because I know me, when I see Him, I realize it's actually better that I don't have control. It's actually better 
that I see him than that I see me in control. Man, have you ever known a, hope I'm using this word right, have you ever known a control freak? And I'm proud of all of you men who didn't look at your wives right then when I said that. You, you know what a control freak is. That's just somebody that they got to feel like they've got it all put together and they've got it all handled and they've got a solution for every dilemma. And you and I both know that reality teaches us that's an illusion. Because, because of the curse of sin, our circumstances, our life is so slippery. That just the moment we think we're in control of something, reality comes and hits us upside the head and reminds us that that dominion's gone. <laughs> well, preacher, if that's the truth, then how can you be smiling? Well, I'll tell you how. Because we see Jesus. We see Jesus who was also created a little lower than the angels. Who, who, uh, who uh, uh, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren saying I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee and again I will put my trust in him and again behold I and the children which God hath given me for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Listen, you can, you can deceive yourself into thinking that you're in control of your whole life, but there's one thing you can never even trick yourself into thinking you control. That's death. It's a reality to every person, and it is not in your hands. And no matter if you think you've got every detail of your life cleverly organized and well under control, death is one thing that no man can even deceive himself into thinking that he has control over. And that fear bothers people to the core. As a matter of fact, it wraps people up and it puts them in bondage. But you know what makes the difference? We see Jesus. We see a Savior that not even death could control him. They put him in a borrowed tomb and three days later that stone rolled away from the door and he came out alive. I'm telling you, we've got a living Savior who took the most out of the control of man thing that there is. The greatest fear of man and said, yeah, I've even got this taken care of. I've even got this under my control. And he, and, and he desired to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them or comfort them that are tempted. Here's the message this morning. Can you accept the fact that you're not in control? And can you be comforted by the fact that Jesus is? We don't have to see ourselves in control of all things to have hope. Because all reality is constantly going to remind us is that we're not in control. So there's no hope in that idea. Here's where the hope is. It's when we see Jesus for who he really is. A God who knows. 
a man who understands, and a Savior who cares. If you haven't trusted in Him for your salvation, I encourage you to trust Him today. But if there's things in your life as a Christian, if you're just struggling with the fact that there, it just seems like life's just out of control, and I, I kind of thought I had it all neatly arranged, and then it just like jumbled. There used to be this game we would play as kids called, I think it was called Concentration. And you put all of these little cubes in this thing and, and you try to get them all out before the timer runs out and it just throws them everywhere. And sometimes that's the way we can treat life. Like, all right, I've got this in control and I've got this in control and I've got this in control and I've got this managed and okay, I about got it. And then all of a sudden the timer goes off and everything goes flying. And you know what? Sometimes we can become a nervous wreck. And what we need to do this morning is just give up the illusion that we have any dominion or any control and just look to Jesus and say, Lord, you're my comfort. You're my hope. I don't have control, but I sure am glad you do. And I trust you. If you've trusted him for your salvation, can you trust him with everything else? He's a faithful God right up here. He's a faithful God who is worthy of our faithful trust. When you can't see all things in subjection under us, see Jesus. That's where our comfort comes.